So we're going live now. Can you hear me now? Can you see me yet? It's not even broadcasting now, is it? not even broadcasting now he says I've got seven people watching on the Facebook live It's not even showing it on my feed. I normally watch it on my iPad at the side. Now it's not even coming up on my iPad now for some reason. Yeah, Potting is live. Yeah. So, how about the slideshow? I'm on the slideshow now. Yep. There's no echo. Yeah, okay. Let's carry on then. Cheers. Right then, everybody. So, in the words of the uh, IT department, turn it off and turn it back on and let's see what happens. Um, for some reason, part of the software is not working, but it appears that we've now got the slides uh, without an echo. So that's one step forward, at least. Uh, better than what we had before. So... Ever so sorry about that. It's been a bit of a juggle and I'm not sure we're all the way there yet uh, because we've got to get some of the other slides up and running. So anyway, we're going to try and carry on as we are uh, and see if this works. Uh, hopefully we won't get the echo back in um, and we'll, uh, we'll kick off. So um, let's start from the beginning, the best place to start. Okay, so this is um, part five of um, uh, our masterclass on how to find land uh, and appraise a building plot which is concerned with renovate or replace. Um, when we uh, see customers, when we go to self-build shows and see customers down at St. Neer, it's our show centre, we often get the question asked, can I knock down my house and replace it with a, a shiny new one? Uh, and it's a great question. Uh, now you might think that uh, a company that specializes in building new houses would always say, yes, of course you can. Um, but it's not as simple as that. Uh, some houses were born to be kept um, and there's protections in place to protect those houses and you should not be knocking those down. But then others are absolutely ideal for replacing and make fantastic self-built plots for all sorts of reasons. 
So uh, this section covers uh, those kind of plots and hopefully gives you some kind of insight into uh, what a, a renovate or replace building plot would look like. So let's go through some of the issues again. Sorry if there's a bit of a duplication here from earlier, but I think it's worthwhile if anyone new is turning in. So replacement dwellings. The first thing to get your head around when you see a house is that that house is sat on a building plot. Um, so the houses are essentially temporary occupants. Uh, they're not there permanently. They might have a residential status attached to them because it's got a house that you pay council tax on, but that doesn't mean you can't knock that house down and replace it. But there are some that have protection, such as listed structures. Uh, maybe in conservation areas there's going to be more control. So it doesn't ring true for all plots, but um, essentially uh, a residential building plot has uh, has a house from a, in a temporary uh, nature. Uh, think of it this way, a house will become dilapidated over time and at some point have to be replaced for safety reasons. Uh, to bring it back up to standard and make sure it's energy efficient, etc. etc. So, um, recycling plots is, is a common thing that happens over many years. Lots of customers go down this route because it's much easier to find a plot that's got a house on it than a plot that's never been built on before. So, often we are replacing structures with new ones, new houses. Um, and because plots are in short supply, there's about 100,000 people wanting to build. Um, this year and that's typically the case for most years and it is growing um, the struggle to find those plots and then start looking at how can we reuse something that's got a, an old dilapidated house on it and therefore about half of the building plots there's about 13 to 14,000 built uh, plots built out each year half of those would come from knockdown and replacements um, so this is probably one of the biggest sources of finding a plot so an excellent prospect Sometimes we look at knockdown and replacements um, and think that it must be risky. Uh, the fact that there's more construction activities involved, um, there's going to be existing neighbours potentially, existing services, maybe contamination on the building, those kind of things make it a risky prospect. And actually the reverse is true. Uh, an existing property that needs to be replaced is a less risky project. Um, much more certainty of it being consented, uh, approved by planning. Uh, and that's because the residential status is set. So you, you do have some benefits, which I'll explain here. So here's the advantages of replacement plots. That proven residential status is worth uh, a lot of money. That's where the value sits in the plot. It's not necessarily in the bricks and mortar. It's all about the, the residential uh, status that that house uh, brings with uh, for the land, uh, the fact you're paying council tax and maybe someone's living in the house, brings that residential status and that offers a guarantee of planning consent for something. Not everything. You might want to build uh, I don't know, a Tudor mansion or a high-end ultra contemporary uh, box but if that doesn't fit in the street scene, that's not going to cut the mustard and get a consent. But you will get a consent for something. And the important thing about that is that the plot retains its value. Um, so if you buy a knockdown and replace but can't get a consent for what you want, then it doesn't mean everything's lost. You know, it still has a residential consent for something. That's worth a lot of money. You do have the opportunity to buy an existing house and uh, increase the size and scale. Uh, depending on the local policy limits, usually about 30%, um, but it does change from local authority to local authority. And it does also change according to the circumstances that surround the house and its location. So the constraints that the street scene and the neighbours might bring. Something called the loss of amenity, which I'll probably explain in a bit. Um, so the opportunity to increase the size and scale makes knockdown and replacements more viable, more profitable, makes them good projects. So this helps the numbers stack up. Often plots, think of a plot, a, a piece of land that's never been built on, often they've not been developed because there could be issues with access. How do you get onto the plot? How do you safely uh, egress and, uh, and exit that plot? Um, or, or you might have to cross other people's land to get to it. And therefore that's a big risk. It can prevent land being developed. But an existing house on a plot will have an access that's established by all the years of driving up the drive um, and therefore from a legal perspective and having direct access maybe onto the 
the uh, adoptable highway means that you're assured that that plot has that access and no one can come along and say uh, that's not safe and therefore you can't get onto that plot you are going to be in a, a much more secure position from a highway safety perspective statutory services whilst they won't necessarily kill plots these days uh, because there's lots of options available such as clargesters for drainage or or Tesla uh, uh, now coming along wanting to supply electricity. Um, so they can become expensive. If you're having to maybe connect onto the grid from some way down the, um, the road, or maybe the drainage connection is in the next door neighbor's house and they don't want you digging a trench across their uh, prized lawn, then that might become a, a problem. Uh, but the fact that you've got an existing house with those existing service connections already connected means that you can reuse those connections and therefore you've got the guarantee that you will not have a nasty surprise with um, extortionate uh, connection costs or some surprises. It, it's usually fairly straightforward. All you're going to have to deal with is the disconnections, um, which isn't as complicated as you'd think. If you want to live out in the open countryside, then it's probably the only way, um, the most probable way to, to achieve um, a new build in open countryside. You can't just go and buy a field, a home for a horse, a paddock, and then expect to go and get a consent. You're going to have to do something exceptional to be able to win a consent on that basis. And they're going to be very, very slim opportunities. So identifying a house that's dilapidated that could be replaced outside of the settlement boundary in open countryside is probably the only way that you're going to do that with some certainty, which is probably why we see quite a lot of these plots coming forward. Um, uh, with knockdown and replacement because that's where someone might want to live. Um, the last point on there, it can be more uh, profitable than refurb and I stress the can. It depends on what the building is, it depends on what costs are involved in the refurb and it depends on what that refurb is going to be worth at the end of the day and you have to make the comparison and, and do the number crunching to figure out if it will be more profitable or not. Strictly speaking, from my point of view, I'm a Yorkshireman, uh, I'm not likely to take a project on, knock it down and replace it, and it cost me money. So that's not a proposition worth uh, considering, and that's why I'll say not all plots should be replaced. Uh, but if you can make sure that the development is profitable, then it should be um, a good opportunity that you should push forward. So there's lots of advantages. And all those advantages take the stress and the risk out of development. Uh, but let's just remember that there might be some sensitivities that have to be considered. So you don't always get what you want, and that's why you might need professional advice. But the advantages give you certainty, and that's worth a lot of money. So how do you figure out if you've identified um, a, a plot um, uh, or you're living in a dilapidated house and you're thinking, should I knock this down or should I replace it? Well, how do you figure that out? Well, it's, it's all about the numbers. Uh, we did a plot appraisal last week um, and that emphasised the point. There's lots of things to consider, but at the end of the day, all the information that you gather uh, all feeds into the financial assessment of the project. And the simple thing is, if it costs you less than it's worth at the end, then it's viable and therefore you should knock down and replace it. Um, if it's going to cost you more, then stop, think, should I be doing it? Is it what I want to do? If it is, and you do it knowingly, absolutely fantastic. Um, drive on, you know, get your project going and do it knowingly. But you shouldn't just knock a, a building down without knowing that the, uh, the numbers stack up. Um, there is some nice articles in Home Building and Renovating magazine, actually. Uh, I did write an article uh, eight, about 18 months ago for Home Building and Renovating, so have a, have a Google around and see if you can find some of those articles on replacement plots. Uh, there's some good material, so that's just a little note there for me to, uh, to signpost that for you. So what considerations should we make when we're looking at uh, replacement plots? Um, the first thing I've got to stress, I think, is that you need specialist advice. Uh, you can't just go and get any architect, building design, architectural technician uh, or planner and say, can you tell me if I can get consent uh, for replacing this house? There are going to be very specific uh, implications um, of, of replacing a house. And depending on what you want to put back, uh, that will affect your chances of getting an approval. 
the fact that you're probably in a, a built up urban area, an urban setting with neighbours is going to be the first and foremost big influencer. Um, so what we're trying to avoid here is causing a, what's called what's known as a loss of amenity to the neighbours. Uh, we don't want the scale of the house whilst the local authority planning department might have a policy to say you can have 30 percent bigger uh, if it's going to stick out like a sore thumb and, and, and create a significant impact that's detrimental to its environment if it causes something that's referred to as harm then the planning authority will say no you're not going to get that so Whilst there is that um, uh, increase in size and scale, it has to fit the context of where you're proposing. It has to fit the street scene. So when we look at the little diagram at the bottom there, uh, you can see I've drawn a red line in between uh, from ridge to ridge to ridge. Um, and that house that I developed was specifically uh, designed in a way to make sure it wasn't any taller than its neighbours, that the windows and its orientation uh, fitted into that street scene. Uh, and therefore, there wasn't a reason to refuse the application. Um, I will talk about these case studies on one of the Facebook live sessions at some point in the future. And we, you, you'll be able to see some of the history behind this particular case. But it was extremely sensitive. And, and just taking that professional advice, God has a planning consent to, um, uh, to put that house there. Uh, so, so maybe tune in for that later. Um, you might have to, depending on the structure that you're replacing, in this case I've, I replaced the village post office. Um, now ordinarily that's a tough thing to do because the village probably doesn't want the post office re replacing. In my case um, the post office it was redundant and there was no sign of a new post office coming. They, they got a volunteer shop down the road so it was a redundant structure. And therefore, I had to apply for um, a change of use. Or so what came with the consent is changing the um, uh, the designation of the plot from a commercial plot to a, a residential plot. In my case, it was pretty straightforward. It was easy to do. Uh, but you might have to prove that case. Uh, if you're trying to change a commercial building that actually is in need, then there might be uh, opposition and objection to that. So just bear that in, that in mind. Um, often with replacements, uh, it's always best to think about the strategy of how you might uh, go about uh, developing a plot. Um, and that's going to require building the bigger picture, building maybe a consensus with the neighbours, understanding the constraints and the impact a, a replacement dwelling might have. So uh, if you simply put something bigger back, is it going to uh, obstruct views? Uh, will there be issues with... Um, impact on listed buildings? Uh, will the new windows be overlook, overlooking garden areas? Will it be too close? Will there be a loss of light? Uh, uh, existing buildings that are fairly close to the boundaries uh, have a right to light. There's some uh, legislation around that. So there's always an impact and therefore those things have to be considered to be able to come up with a strategy that's more likely to fit your brief as an individual and win a consent um, for that uh, project. So it's not as straightforward as people think, whilst it has certainty that you will get a consent, working out the, the ideal thing can be a bit of a challenge and that's why you need a professional. Try and, uh, if you find a plot that you think you want to uh, replace, it's always worthwhile taking a walk down the streets uh, and looking at the features. Now the image I've shown here shows a couple of structures. This is the, the street that this, um, this house that I replaced uh, was sat on. Now the local authority isn't going to want you to replicate a, the listed thatched cottage that's uh, three or four hundred years old. We're not trying to do that. But what you might do is look for inspiration from the more modern building. You know the, the building at the bottom there. It's about a hundred years old actually. Uh, probably a Georgian building using uh, local materials um, and those local materials are easily sourced and therefore that might offer influence of what you might replace it with. So often the answers are, are sat in front of you, just waiting to be picked up on to get that local inspiration. Now the planning policies um, are written in such a way that they promote, they want you to build innovative structures, they want to advance architecture and therefore it should be more supportive. Typically planning officers have to deal with um, the general public uh, and therefore there might be a resistance to being too way out but I think what works really well when you're replacing uh, dwellings in uh, the centre of 
an existing urban area is the use of traditional local materials that are common to that area maybe taking those materials and use them in a, a more contemporary way and therefore we don't fall foul of replicating the past and, and building a pastiche doesn't always ring true because we have people administering the policies but uh, uh, try and think of maybe the planning strategy that's going to get what you want but at least play some sympathies back to the local area I think it's really important to take that time other considerations you're going to have I've kind of mentioned listed structures earlier um, and also conservation areas people can be um, pretty uh, scared of developing a house in a conservation area. We do have people that come along and say, uh, I'd like to um, maybe replace this dwelling, but it's in a conservation area. Now, from our point of view at Potter, we're very used to dealing with um, the restrictions a conservation area has, and we actually think it's a great place to, to redevelop. The guiding principle here is you must enhance the area uh, of a conservation area. So, 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 so long as you're replacing that structure, which is going to have a positive impact, then that is likely to receive a consent. If you're likely to replace um, a lovely building with something that's damn ugly and ill-fitting on the plot, then that's going to cause harm. And the policies uh, around conservation areas and protecting that, uh, that area are then going to say no. So as long as your proposal is sensitive to the area and offers the right answer, then it's probably a good area to redevelop. Sometimes people don't appreciate that listed structures aren't just protected from the structure themselves. So, you know, if you're going to buy a listed cottage, don't think you can run around with a, a lump hammer. Uh, knocking walls out and, uh, and modifying it at will you're not going to be able to do that and equally if you're going to build a house within a protected zone uh, uh, within a, a reasonable distance of uh, an, a listed structure then there's going to be equal protections and they're not obvious sometimes and it's another reason why professionals would want to take a, a perspective churches can be pretty challenging now i'm not suggesting you're going to knock a church down and replace it with a house but if you're building a house and you start to obstruct the view um, from somewhere else in the village um, on that church then that could be frowned upon and prevent that house from being developed so the fact there's a bungalow there and you want to put a house there but it obstructs the view then you're going to run into some difficulties and therefore again that's another reason why you need a professional to guide you through those sensitivities of the location. Other problems you might run into with replacing dwellings, um, you might have an existing structure that's uh, had the benefit of maybe having a few holes in the lost space um, and these little critters have managed to get in there and nest. So the humble bat, um, so under ecology issues uh, the planning authority are going to have the responsibility to make sure that these are protected and, and managed through the redevelopment process. So it'd be a usual question to ask and expect through the planning process that you have to go out, do a number of surveys, figure out if you've got any ecology. Um, and typically, bats in um, existing structures um, uh, would be found. You might have found a lot of them, uh, but the fact that they are there means you then have to manage them. Um, the surveys are going to cost you a bit more money and therefore that has to be kind of built into the uh, financial appraisal when you're looking at uh, replacing the dwelling. So don't forget that cost. Um, and you might have to do a number of surveys to uh, actually build the bigger picture, but they, those, those bats are gonna have to be relocated. So there's a cost there as well. Typically ecology won't just cost money, it might cost you time. And if you're in a bit of a hurry and you've found a plot that needs replacing, but there's a load of ecology issues such as bats, then be prepared to have a bit more of a long haul to, to resolve those issues. So that can create some sensitivities, I think, around simply knocking a building down. Now, people also think that if you're going to knock a building down, and that's expensive, it looks like a big job. It's not a job that you and your wife tackle on a Sunday afternoon with uh, a couple of lump hammers um, and down to the local tip or, or, or better still get a, get a skip. That's, that's not how it happens. But the truth is, provided that there's no nasty hazardous materials such as say asbestos uh, on an existing structure and typically on residential houses you don't get a lot of that, then demolishing a house is really easy, um, straightforward and not that expensive. 
Uh, a house like this would be uh, expected to be well under £10,000 to demolish and probably only three or four days work for that big digger as it uh, rips through the roof and uh, destroys the walls. Um, the fact that most of the materials can be salvaged and recycled uh, reduces the cost of demolition and what the contractors do, the specialists that do this job, um, they won't want to fill skips and pay uh, landfill tax for disposing of waste. What they're going to do is turn those those materials into commodities and then they resell those so there's value to recover. And therefore replacing or demolishing a house uh, isn't as expensive uh, as you would think. So often that is not the barrier to replacing a house. It's more likely to be the fact it's um, uh, listed or something like that. So don't think of that being a barrier. Don't think that you have to manage that uh, or deal with that uh, demolition. Uh, there will be notices that the local authority require and that's a bit of administration. But in my experience, it's not that difficult and the demolition contractors would handle all those issues anyway, all as part of the package. So don't let that become an obstacle, it's much easier. If you're going to demolish a structure, you're going to have to deal with things like service uh, terminations. You can't just leave the electricity buzzing in the corner whilst you replace the walls around the meter. That's going to be dangerous. So there's going to be a little bit of notice that's going to be required. Uh, and surprisingly, when I did my last bit, uh, demolition, it didn't cost me anything. They just came and disconnected it and I paid for reconnections later. Um, the fact that you've got um, on, on things like water services um, an existing connection means there's uh, an infrastructure allowance associated with that building. So that lowers your, dis your, your reconnection cost later as well. So there's, this system has some inbuilt savings as well. So you're not going to have those type of uh, problems. It's just a little bit of aggro to plan that, those disconnections in. Another issue you might face when you're coming to uh, replace a house um, or maybe build in the garden. Now what's happened here um, on this picture is there's an existing house, perfectly good house, but actually um, the person that owns this plot has recognised that they want a different, more, more scalable, a bigger house, more suited to their family needs. And they've built um, in the garden. Um, now what you might find is that if you're... Um, something's been built in the garden before or you're replacing that structure and someone's recognised that there's going to be some money to be made out of this, then a previous owner uh, might um, apply a covenant um, or an over overage to that plot that says that if you go and redevelop this, this building plot, uh, this house is a building plot, and make lots of money, then I want a third or a half or whatever that... Um, overage states um, a share of the profits and that must be remembered and you must understand if there's any legal issues attached to that plot. Um, I have come across things like covenants, restrictive covenants that have prevented uh, plots being redeveloped or, or plots being built in the garden is a good example um, and things like it might say this this plot is suitable for a residential house and, and it'd be okay to knock down and replace it but if you wanted to put two back then that would be a complete no-no and that covenant would have to be re uh, released uh, and to do that the beneficiary may require some inducement and that could be expensive it's a bit like a ransom strip so you need to know the legals associated with it to know if anyone's tried to prevent um, apply a restriction to the land and to stop it from redeveloped it might be a neighbor for instance trying to protect a view uh, something like that so you do need to get a conveyancing solicitor to look over your plans before you make a commitment to buy because that might have some hidden issues in there. Um, a few of the considerations. Don't forget the NIMBYs, uh, the Not In My Backyard Brigade. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. You know, sometimes the NIMBYs have got a, a hell of a job to protect the right buildings for good reasons. Um, but sometimes you can find structures that, for some reason, have got some sensitivities attached to them, um, some local connection uh, that the local community wants to defend. And here's a good example. This is a website where people have identified a building that's had some history and therefore they don't want to see that building demolished, even though it looks like something that's uh, in disrepair and should be replaced. So you've got to make sure you understand if there is those kind of sensitivities and figure out how do you deal with them. Maybe go and talk to the neighbours and say, 
you know, I'm thinking of redeveloping. You might want to not give the whole game up, but just see if they start to raise the eyebrow, uh, share some opinions. Uh, when I knocked the village post office down, I got all sorts of stories about when people were kids buying sweets in the shop or buying the paper and the reminisced. Uh, luckily, the building was so dilapidated, no one wanted it. So it was uh, an easy uh, fight to win. But, but there was local sentiment attached to the structure and that can be the source of... Uh, objection to the planning so make sure you try and consider that and build a strategy around how you might approach the replacement to keep those people on side or build the picture that 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 structure needs to be replaced for good reason um, so long as you engage um, and you pick the plots that don't have you know some real uh, sensitive history um, then then pick the right fight that there's no reason why you can't overcome these things it's important to remember that policy is much more uh, important and stronger than objection. Just because someone's objected doesn't mean that that can't be developed or replaced. Uh, policy will still be applied by the local authority planning officers. And so long as you've considered all those other things like street scenes and designations and listed structures and uh, made sure there's no loss of immunity, there's no reason why you shouldn't win out. But it might just be a fight that you might not want. So just think about the history as well. So if you're going to choose, going to go out there and look for one of these plots, what do you look for? Uh, now the guiding principle is that you've got to think like a developer. Really, really important you do this. Try and take the emotion out of the choice of how to approach a replacement plot. The first question, these are the, a number of key questions you should ask yourself before um, uh, buying a house to knock down. The first question is, is the project profitable? Is it viable? Will it make money? Is it going to cost me more than it's worth at the end? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer in this. If, if you're happy that you're going to spend more money than it's worth at the end, and you know that and you still want to do it, then hey, go, go ahead and do it. Uh, but like I said earlier, I'm not the type of person that's likely to want to spend more money than the project's worth at the end. So making sure I get my money back is the first cardinal rule not to break. To figure that out, you need to know a few key facts. So how much would uh, maybe the new house be worth um, in the local, local area? A nice, new, shiny, energy efficient, modern uh, property be worth? It's probably going to be worth far more than something that's old, un unsuitable, dilapidated and inefficient. Um, and that gap in performance and the gap in the quality of the architecture kind of makes these the the, um, the numbers stack up. So understanding what the local prices are uh, is really important. I'll do a bit of evaluation in a moment, so I'll just hold that thought for a moment. Um, you also need to know the development costs. So it's fairly straightforward to figure out how much to build a house. Uh, well, it is when you're working with Potter. Maybe if you're on Grand Designs, they find that particularly troublesome. And I don't know why, because it's not that difficult to figure out. But if you know the cost of building the, the house, all you've got to figure out then are what are the site-specific costs that go with knocking down this house and replacing it. So the demolition. Uh, maybe dealing with boundaries, maybe dealing with um, the ecology, the bats, those kind of site specifics, the abnormals. And once you add those things together, then you can basically compare um, the cost to develop against the what it's worth at the end. And so long as you've got some money left in your pocket, that's a great plot. Uh, and it's going to give you um, a great answer, I, I would suggest. In terms of tying down those costs, yeah, focus on things like demolition. Make sure you can do it safely. There's going to be some hidden costs in some, uh, maybe some arrangements such as protection scaffold or protecting pedestrians while you do the demolition. Probably not going to be expensive, but they're those little hidden costs that people forget. Don't forget about those hazardous, hazardous materials such as asbestos. If you're buying a residential property uh, to knock down, then the owner doesn't have to tell you if there's any asbestos. Whereas if you're buying a commercial property to knock down, there is a legal obligation for them to tell you if there's any contamination. So there's two different obligations there. Uh, but you can't just sit back and wait for someone to tell you. I think you need to be asking those intelligent questions to say, is there any hazardous material? Um, and uh, if you don't get an answer back, then you might have to do a bit of investigation yourself. Uh, don't forget, whilst you might get a house with a nice little drive that you can get your um, uh, your Ford Focus up and down uh, quite comfortably, 
um, to be able to live in that house. The kind of equipment you're going to need to do a demolition is different, bigger, uh, more imposing, and therefore do you have access to demolish? Um, you do not have a legal right to access uh, somebody else's land to make uh, to demolish a building. You do if you want to repair and maintain. Uh, the law does protect you in that right. But if you've got to access third party land for demolition, then you need to make sure that you have a, uh, a legal right to do that. So make sure you check out uh, the access arrangements. Um, number three, can can the plot support a bigger building? So. Remember, I've said a few times that if you can get 30% bigger area, then that's going to help the numbers stack up um, and make uh, all the investment you're going to make into um, uh, paying for all the construction work. Um, the increase in value with, with a bigger house makes these numbers stack up. But if the plot's not big enough to support a bigger house or the neighbours um, are, are maybe bungalows and you want to build a house, um, then you're unlikely to find that space to build that bigger house. And therefore, even though you could replace it, you can't get the size you want. It, it, it You won't be able to get the increased value. And therefore, it's not possible. Uh, so you've got to tie that down and understand the local policies and look for those those gaps. So when I'm going on to right move, typically looking around, I'm looking for space, looking for depth. Um, I'm looking for some gaps on, on the width uh, and seeing if we can um, build into those gaps. Um, I'm also looking for tall ridge heights, those kind of things, to be able to maybe build up. Um, some people would say, well, it might be two bungalows next door and there is no height, but how about going down? And you could, but just remember the cost of be building basements is probably equal to or more than the value it creates. Uh, if you're in London, it's fine, but elsewhere in the country, if, you, if it's Doncaster, where I'm come from, you'll never find a basement because they just don't stack up from the cost value perspective. So ideally, you're looking for space on plots uh, to build into to get the, uh, the scale up. Look at the alternatives as well. Um, so if you found a house that's lovely, it's, it's a Georgian, might not be listed, but maybe a Georgian um, uh, kind of property, uh, something that might look like our Milchester at the show centre then that's actually a valuable house in its own right if it's got period features and, and maybe shouldn't be replaced. And so those kind of properties should be protected, uh, looked after uh, and invested into to bring that back to life. Um, so don't just assume that everything should be replaced. You know, the, the protected ones are, uh, shouldn't be and certainly the ones that offer uh, a good basis to maybe extend from or, or if you can't find the uh, uh, the story that hangs up to uh, to make the numbers work then then don't do it look at a different um, alternative uh, but remember period properties I think are particularly troublesome um, uh, and they're going to have additional costs but but actually it might be worthwhile to get the value back because um, Georgian properties is a good example of worth quite a lot of money so they're the four different things that you should consider before hurtling into knocking down the um, the front wall of your house. Now, from a viability point of view, making sure this thing uh, is worth doing, uh, I'll run through the equation here. It's really, really simple. All you need to do is figure out the house that you want to replace, uh, what, what you want to build, and figure out the end value, what it's going to be worth when I've finished it. Um, and you might do that by getting a design, going down to see a, a estate agent, using Zoopla as a bit of a guide that they give you sell prices um, and figuring out that, uh, that end value in the area. Once you have that, all you need to do is deduct your costs and all the costs involved in a project from buying the existing property and the legal expenses and stamp duty that goes with it. Um, but also things like fees, design and planning fees and, uh, and maybe the demolition costs or the abnormal costs that go with um, dealing with the, uh, the demolitions and putting that, uh, that plot back into use for a new residential building. And you also need to deduct the construction costs. And when you deduct all these things, what's left, hopefully, should be in the black, not in the red. Uh, so if we look at a simple example, uh, we've, we've decided we're going to build, let's say, a, a Grandston. Uh, one of our popular houses and once we've finished that it's going to be worth half a million pounds so five hundred thousand pounds we've got that up there the estate agents told us that so then we've gone away and figured out that uh, through negotiation to be able to buy this dilapidated little bungalow uh, it's going to cost us 300k that sounds like an expensive plot um, and it doesn't 
automatically feel like you should buy something for three hundred thousand pound and knock it knock it down. But let's run the numbers a little bit further. So the um, the purchase price is going to be three hundred thousand pound. The design and planning fees are going to be five k. That's about what we work to. Uh, others will do it for more or less, you know. So research that, figure out which route you want to take for design. Um, there's going to be some surveys to maybe figure out where the bats are living, uh, deal with those kind of issues as part of the planning process. That's another couple of k. Um, might be some topographical surveys uh, to work out what, how much space you've got to be able to fill and how that uh, proposal might fit on the plot. So that's a, a three more thousand pound to spend there. The demolition costs, you could get a quote from a specialist. There's £8,000 there. So these costs are starting to mount up. And then the big one hits you, which is the the new build uh, construction costs. Now, you're not going to get a Gransden for 250 but you might get, a, say, a, a Caxton or, or maybe something bespoke that's um, of an appropriate size. But let's imagine the, uh, the replacement is going to be £250,000. So all those things added together cost you £568,000. And that's a smaller number than what it's worth at the end. And therefore, it's viable. It's no more complicated than that. What ruins this perfectly straightforward um, equation is that the variables of what you might want to build, what might be involved in from a complexity point of view, how you might build it and what different expenses that come from, they're all variables. And you've got to try and find the right mix, the right answer that lowers your construction cost but but uh, maximizes its end value and creates the surplus which keeps your project profitable and if you can do that then you've got a, a great project so if we do the maths on this in this case there's a profit of thirty two thousand pound now that's great but i don't think i think there's more money to be made than that and you might play the variables like i suggested but don't forget this is a new build you've demolished the building down to the ground in which case you can recover your VAT and there's another £20,000 lurking in your um, quotations and your expenses that you can recover as a result of the new build so by replacing with a new build rather than refurbishment you're going to make £52,000 on this project straightforward as that so you've got to do your research and understand your numbers to make sure these things stack up don't forget there's this little thing called the community infrastructure levy um, and if you're going to build a bigger house than what's there that exists at the moment, so you're going to go from 200 square metres to 250 square metres, or 260 if you're going to go the full 30%, then the extra 60 square metres, um, the local authority will expect you to pay your community infrastructure levy charge. Now, where I live at the moment, it's £85 per square metre, so times by 60, that's a reasonable size bill. But the good news is as a self-builder, you can claim your exemption before, provided you do that before starting the construction work. If you're doing this as a development to make profit or maybe build a house to rent out at the end, then that's an expense you're going to have to accept and pay. So that should then go into this equation to see if this project stacks up for you. So don't forget about that. So it should be a simpler, simpler case as crunching the numbers in that way. Lots of research needed, uh, so get out there and, um, and try and figure out your routes to build, etc. and find out um, what construction costs you might incur. Um, and, and then you can probably move on some some projects. Here's an example of one we came across and we helped someone develop. So um, here's a house, a perfectly lovely house in an in a absolutely ideal location. Um, and this customer came along and said, uh, I own the field in the back uh, and what I'd like to do is build uh, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three houses in the in the back field. So when we appraised this project and um, given our professional planning experience, we looked at the project, we went and did our research and quickly figured out, uh, you can see the field at the back in red there, it was outside the settlement boundary and therefore the planning policies prevented development in that field. So uh, in this case, the answer for that customer was no, you can't build in the field. But with the replacement plot in mind, we then started to think about, well, what could you actually do? Now, one choice you might want to take is building the access, access way to the field. That field was just used as uh, garden land, effectively. They just mowed the lawn and played football every now and again, so they didn't particularly need an access. So that was a choice, but it would only put a small house um, in that uh, that location as you can see there in red 
But once we'd crunched the numbers and the customer had gone away and actually done their own research and figured out um, how they can make their project more, more viable, they soon figured out that by knocking down the existing perfectly good house and making both plots uh, reasonably uh, sizable, they could get two decent sized houses in there. And that more than compensated for the construction costs involved and made that opportunity to stack up. So in this case, they've got two uh, reasonably, uh, very large actually, uh, plots um, and sold off the second plot, which uh, paid for the construction of the new house. So in essence, they've got a free new house, which, which, which is worth quite a lot of money and kept the field at the back. So often you have to think a little bit laterally and just think, well, what are the alternatives? Uh, and in this case, it, it did stack up to replace uh, the existing house and make better use of the overall land. So there's a nice little example. Uh, and there's endless examples, uh, all with different stories out there. So maybe come and talk to us and we'll, uh, we'll give you a few more. So here's a few more just to give you a bit of inspiration to leave you with. These are uh, fairly small, modest bungalow. Uh, it looks like it's probably 40, 50, 60 years old, something like that. Uh, but the policy there uh, and its location enabled us to get something rather sizable um, uh, and working strategically through the, um, the, the planning approach uh, enabled us to win a consent that uh, was much, much bigger. And you can see why that would be worth far more than the existing property. And so long as the extra value pays for the construction costs, it's the right thing to do. I don't see any architectural merit to the bungalow. Therefore, there's no reason why it shouldn't be replaced. And I don't see any um, structures that uh, or neighbours that are going to be harmed by the development so therefore we've got quite a, a big replacement in there. This is a actually a great little example because it's the kind of plot that's not obvious to most people. Now, now here's a bungalow on the left hand side probably from the 80s it's on an estate um, but this family was growing they needed to have more space more room um, and because the next door neighbor, you quite, can't quite see the next door neighbor's house in this location, but they had a house next door. That meant that even though there was a bungalow there, you could build up. So the space in this case was to build up. So they replaced that house with uh, uh, that, that bungalow with a house of similar architectural style. And therefore, the increase in value paid for the replacement of that house and got them something that suited their family much better. So it was a great opportunity for that family to move forward. So even the not so obvious um, uh, opportunities can stack up if you crunch the numbers and find the right answer. Uh, another big one, uh, so a small bungalow into a, a lovely big house. Again, you know, it's in a location where it's not going to have harm to other people and maybe the planning strategy played the policies out uh, very well to maximise the opportunity. But a, another house that's going to be worth a lot more money than what it started out as a, an existing bungalow. So there's a few examples. Uh, there's lots more that we have. Um, so there's a taster of the important things that I think uh, you should consider when you're thinking about renovating or replacing. The answer is not straightforward. Uh, if you go to a self-build show and you walk up to a, a self-build package company like Plot and you say, I've got a house, I want to knock it down. And the uh, staff on the stand sit there and say, absolutely, it's the right thing to do. It's the lying, they don't know. It's not the uh, obvious answer. The only way you're gonna find out if you're taking the right route is to go away, figure out what a replacement might look, look like, figure out if you can get extra space, figure out if you can drive the value up to the extent that the construction costs are paid. And therefore, if your project is profitable by doing that, then that's a replacement. Don't forget about all those other uh, issues, the context, the street scenes, the uh, impact on neighbours. They're all really important things. And don't think that you should buy some dilapidated listed cottage and just expect to knock it down. That's not going to happen um, or obstruct the view of a church. So there's lots of other constraints that have to be considered. But um, there's lots of projects out there. There's lots of old houses that are just begging to be replaced and a better answer to be put on that plot. Um, so go and do your research, get on to Rightmove, get on to Zoopla, uh, come and talk to us and, um, and bring your projects forward. Um, I think it's more straightforward than what you think once you get ahead around the detail. Hope that's been useful. I'm ever so sorry about tonight with the technology. For some reason, the laptop just wasn't having it. So turning it off, hitting it with a brick seemed to help and hopefully 
um, next week if you tune in then um, we'll have it uh, off first time um, next week I'm going to cover how to buy a building plot uh, the process of buying a building plot and the uh, the process of valuing a building plot um, which is similar to renovation uh, or replacement uh, plots but uh, a little bit more detail we have a model that we provide people with so that's a quite an interesting uh, subject so we'll deal with that um, on Thursday we've got Paul Newman back uh, so he's going to cover how to choose building system so looking at the different alternatives, uh, what's important to think about uh, from an energy performance point of view. Now, Paul is the guru when it comes to uh, building systems. Uh, so tune in for that. I think that will be uh, well worth uh, uh, watching. So I'll see you then. I'll be on answering questions and I'm sure he'll get uh, the technology working right first time. Thank you for spending the evening with me and I'll see you uh, in a week's time. Thank you. Bye.